just want to make it clear that that song is by no way an endorsement of staying up all night in hopes that you'll do well on the midterm. Um, okay, so today we're going to talk about what's on the midterm. I'm going to tell you all of the questions um, and the answers. No. Um, people are like, oh, I should, should have come today. Um, yeah, so we'll talk about the format. We'll go over some questions. We'll look, I, I went through the responses to the forum post last night and pulled out some questions from the last quizzes. I'm also happy to take questions once we get through some of that material. Um, you know, my goal today is to do things that are helpful to get you prepared to take the midterm this week, whatever that is. So, okay. Um, so I just want to point out, I mean, four weeks ago, we started this. Four weeks ago, I was standing here for the first time. And, you know, for some of you, that was the first day that you ever wrote a single line of code. So you've come a long way. Um, and yeah, I'm really happy with the progress the class is making. I've been really excited to see people, you know, working so hard on the homework problems, um, practicing every day, coming in for help. I think the office hour situation is working out a little bit better this year. Um, but, you know, you, know, you guys should, should take a moment this week to sort of just take a breath and think about kind of what you've accomplished over the last week, last month. We're about a third of the way through the semester. This is week five, so we have a lot more to do, actually. So we're gonna get quite a bit farther through the semester, but we've already come a long way. Again, particularly for those of you that were new to this when we started. So, look, the, the goal of this midterm exam is not to stack rank students. In the past, this course had a final exam. Before that, it had midterm exams and a final. Um, I decided this semester to have three midterm exams spaced throughout the semester. There are a couple reasons for that. One is that I want sort of a checkpoint to make sure that we, that you're ready to go on, that you've absorbed what we need you to know over the past month so that you can succeed in the next two months of this class. Okay, so again, the, the midterm is not punitive. It's not like we're angry. It's not like we're trying to, to get you or you know, we're trying to show who's who in the class or whatever, or separate the wheat from the chaff or whatever sort of metaphor you want to use. The goal is we want to know, we want you to know whether or not you're set up for success for the rest of the semester. So the kind of questions, particularly the programming questions that we ask on this week's midterm are really inspired, you know, when I was writing it, I was thinking, what do I really need students to know? What do I need to make sure that they are solid on? Things that they can just do without a lot of help from the CAs, without, you know, a lot of online resources, things that should be second nature by now, something that should be, just fall off your fingertips, right? That's, that's what's on the exam. Okay, so let's talk about the format a little bit. So there are, the, the midterm is similar to the quizzes that you've already taken. Uh, there's a, just only two small differences. One is that there are fewer multiple choice questions. The other is that the programming questions are worth a little bit more as a percentage of the exam. So it's about half and half. About 50% of the points are from uh, the multiple choice questions. Excuse me, there's also one of these free response questions that's gonna be graded by hand. Uh, but there's 12 multiple choice questions. These are mainly on code reading. Um, so you've seen some of these before. There is one question that's like the one that we looked at on Friday's homework. So this is a what does this piece of code do answer in a sentence. Um, you'll be able to submit that question as many times as you want. You can see your results this time. Um, note that you will not get points during the midterm for this question. You will get a zero because we're grading it offline. So after the midterm exam, at some point this week, someone's going to take all of your responses and go through and manually grade them. So in the CBTF, again, there is no way to get points for this question. I thought about just giving everybody points, but then I thought oh, that's a little deceptive. Rather start you with zero, and then at some point later we'll correct your score. So, you know, the, the maximum that you can get on the midterm in the quiz center is not 100. It's like 100 minus however many points this question is worth. That gets four. So it's 96. Okay? And then there are four programming questions. All right? And here is what these questions are. Here are the topics for these questions. So there's one question, and again, these are, you know, motivated by things that we need you to know. So there's one that asks you to use an array. Do something with an array, okay? There's a second one that asks you to use a multidimensional array. Do something with a multidimensional array. These are 
again, not trick questions. These are similar to many of the homework problems that you've already seen. This thing is struggling today. When using strings, you know, do some processing on a string. Again, similar to the problems you've seen, similar to some of the problems we'll go over today. And, and the final question is one where we're gonna ask you to implement an algorithm. I'm actually describing the algorithm. That's a particular problem we're asking you to solve, similar to something that you've done in the past. There's a long description of this in the question. It says, here is a potential way to approach this problem. And then you're expected to sort of flesh that out with code. This one is a little bit longer than the other programming questions on the exam. It requires like a couple of stages. But again, there's a lot of text there to help you think through it. So we're really not asking you to come up with an algorithm to solve the problem. We're asking you to implement an algorithm that we provide. Unless you want to do it in some other way, in which case you're, that's totally up to you. Okay, so again, this, this problem is, requires you to write a little bit more co code, but it's also more scaffolded in that we're providing you with more information about how to solve it. Questions about the format of the exam? Yeah, great question. So the question is, on the what does this code do question, can you submit multiple times? The answer is yes. We are only going to grade the last one, right? And this is particularly important. Remember, there's a, there's a, a, a poor sap who has to sit down with 900 of these and go through them. Thankfully, that's not me, but someone is gonna do that, and so they're not gonna go through like 3,000, right? We'll take your last submission. The question is clear about this. So if you make a small mistake, or there's a little typo, or you want to clear things up, yeah, you can submit it as many times as you want. Great question. Other questions about the format? The TAs are looking at the exam right now. We're gonna try to squash any bugs that might be in. Yeah? Will we still have the two attempts we have on the multiple choice? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know why I do that. I'm so nice. Yeah. Okay, good question. So this is, so the programming questions are gonna ask you to write functions. Yeah. All four of the programming questions will ask you to write functions. We're not gonna have you provide the wrapper class. The, pro the homework problems this week, as you've started to see, we're actually starting to have you provide the wrapper class. In the past, what we did, actually we've gone through three stages with these. At the beginning, what we did is we took your code and we actually shoved it inside a function. Then we took your functions and we shoved them inside a class. Now you're at the point where you're actually just designing the whole class yourself. But for this exam, all four of these questions will ask you to write a function. And we will tell you exactly what you need to do there. Good question. Other questions? About format. Yeah. Correct, so the question is what, what's the coverage? The coverage is uh, everything up through last Wednesday. There is no object coverage on the, on the midterm. That will, we'll start that up next week. Okay, other questions? Yeah, to Malcolm. No, you gotta speak up, I, I can't hear anything you're saying. Yeah, you gotta, you gotta work with the libraries that you have already, yeah. There's no way to do, in, so the question is, can you import external libraries? No. No. That's not, that's not unintentional, right? Like we, we, these are problems we think you should be able to solve using the tools that, that, that we've, what we've discussed. In the future, you will be able to, yeah. Question? It's a, it's a 50, I guess it's a 50 minute slot in the CBTF, is that how it works? Whatever, it's whatever the normal thing is for quizzes. I guess I put 60 on my cover slide, but. Yeah, the length is identical to the quizzes you've already taken. All right, any other questions about this before we go on? I don't see any, okay. So let's go over a couple of the questions from quiz three. If you want to look at some of the multiple choice questions, we can do that. So here's one of them that um, a number of people got wrong. This is, the, and, and this is the kind of question that you might see tomorrow through Thursday on the midterm. The code reading question. It provides you a function, the function does something, 
I'm gonna ask you some questions about. So the question here that seemed to flummox people, I picked ones that, that people did poorly on for whatever reason. Um, what happens if this function is called with two empty arrays? All right, so let's, let's walk through this. So if x and y are both empty, what are their lengths? Zero. These are not null arrays. That's an important distinction. These are arrays that have been created, they just have no elements. So what happens on line two? If the two are empty, are their lengths different? No, they're the same, so I'm not gonna enter the block on line three. What about line five? So line five is a loop that's going through all the elements of the arrays, or it's going from zero to x dot length. Will that loop code ever execute? Nope. So what's gonna happen? Turn true. You know, so for these return function questions, or for, for these questions about, you know, what is this going to return? What happens? You know, I'm, one, one valid way to do this is essentially sort of start with the return statement. So I start with the return statement on line three, and I say, okay, when am I gonna get in here? I'm gonna get in here if the lengths of the two arrays are different. They're both empty, are they different? No, they're both zero, so I'm never gonna hit that one. Getting to the return statement on line seven requires that the loop execute. Is that loop ever going to execute? No, because x dot length is zero. So i starts out, the condition starts out false. So the loop body is never executed. And so the only return value that I could possibly get to with two empty arrays is the final on line time. Turn true. Questions about this question? Okay, maybe there's just like a moment of confusion or weakness in the CBTF. All right, another question from quiz three. What do we call the combination of the function name and list of argument types that is used by Java to determine which function to call if there are multiple ones with one name? We refer to that as function signature. Yeah. So it's the name, and then it's the list of argument types. Okay. All right. We're gonna come, I, I have a comment to make about this in a minute. All right. So here's an example of method overloading. Two functions called multiply. One returns an int, the other returns a double. The first one takes three integer arguments. The second one takes two double arguments. And then on line seven, I'm calling multiply. What type of parameters am I passing? What are 10 and 20 at this point? They're ints. Is there a method here that matches this? No, there's not. Right, I've got one multiply that takes three ints, and I have a second multiply that takes two floats. Okay, so am I stuck? What happens at this point? Jeremy. Right, so remember that Java will automatically convert or change the types for you if it can do that without losing precision. So Java will take an int and convert it to a double. And it will try to do this in order to find a function that matches the right signature. So in this case, what will happen is the compiler will say, huh, I don't see a method named multiply that takes two ints. Let me try converting one of those ints to a float. Okay, do I see a multiply that takes an int and a float? No. Okay, and let me try converting both of them to floats. Ah, okay, now I find a multiply that I can use. And that's the one that's defined on line four. It takes two, sorry, two doubles. I keep saying floats. Two doubles. Questions about this? Yeah, function type. This will, this will become more important as we start talking about objects because it's common for objects to provide multiple methods with different function signatures, different method signatures. All right, so here's an interesting question. This was not on the quiz. Why isn't the return type part of the method signature? Yeah.
Yeah, so, so the reason is that when the program's being compiled, I don't necessarily, the, the programmer doesn't necessarily specify what the return type that they expect from the function is. Sometimes I do. Sometimes I might say, you know, int i is equal to the result of calling a function. But in this case, I'm calling system.out.println, and I'm asking it to print the result of calling this function. So it turns out that println can print ints, bytes, floats, characters, strings. So there's really no way to tell. There's no way for the compiler to tell. If there were two versions of multiply, like there are, one that takes an int, and uh, one that returns an int, and one that returns a double, and they had the same function signature, method signature, there'd be no way for the compiler to tell whether or not I was expecting to get a double back or expecting to get an int back. Because println will print both of them happen. Yeah, so this is the reason this, this isn't the case. Okay. So, I'm gonna give you guys two minutes. I'm gonna do a little warm up exercise together. Sum all the values in a one-dimensional array of integers. This is one of those things that hopefully by now is like muscle memory, right? So write a little function, you can call it whatever you want. Well, you know what, if you want it to work here without making an edit, call it array sum. Have it return the sum of an array of integers. I'll give you two minutes to work on that. So examples like this are the kind of thing that, you know, by now, hopefully through the practice we've given you on the programming problems that are online, I mean, you really need to be able to just bang this out, right? This should just be something that's sort of embedded in your fingertips. We want to get to the point where doing examples like this are muscle memory, right? I've got a loop that goes through an array. 
be able to just type that one fluid motion. What goes inside the loop can vary. So you might want to think about different twists on this problem, right? Give yourself a challenge. Say, okay, um, let me think about different types of ways I might want to test the values in the array to see if I want to include them in the sum. Or maybe I want to count the number of values of a certain type in the array. Or maybe I want to only use a certain part of the array, like I only want to use the first half of the array or the second half of the array or something like that. And then you can start sort of making little modifications to this. But this core loop, this core, I don't know what to call it, this little bit of code, this, this type of function is something that, you know, we really should be, you really should be at the point, at this point in the semester where you can write this, right? Repeatedly over and over correctly, uh, without lots of syntax errors, without having to sort of stare at compiler output for long periods of time. All right. So let's go through some problems from quiz three. And I've chosen a couple, uh, that people asked to look at, and also that people struggled on in quiz three. All right, so one of the questions asks you to reverse a string. So how are we gonna do this? Remember, before you start writing code, and I would encourage you to do this on the midterm and anytime you're in the CBTF as well, anytime you're working on these practice problems, this is not just something that, that is a good idea on the MP. We wanna think about, you know, how are we approaching the problem? What's our algorithm? What's the series of steps that we're gonna try to follow? So I'm gonna propose the following algorithm for this. I'm gonna go through the, the string that's passed to the function backwards. So now I need another one of those loops. That's a little bit harder. You might, you might have to think a little bit harder about how to write this one, but it is another one that you should be really used to. Backwards iteration through a string or an array. So I'm gonna go through the pass string backwards from the end to the beginning, and I'm gonna take each character, I'm gonna, and I'm gonna append it to a new string that I've created that I'm gonna build up as I go. And then when I'm done, what I'll have is the string in reverse order. There are other ways to do this. There are approaches to this problem that go through the pass string forwards and build up the string from the end to the front. So we can do that one as well. Okay, so let's try this guy. Uh, it's called reverse string. All right, first thing to get my method signature, so let's look over here. It says, write a function called reverse string, it takes a single string argument and returns that string reversed. So the return type here is going to be string. The method name is reverse string, and the parameter is a string. And I'll call that one to reverse. I'm gonna go back here and make sure that I'm doing all the input validation I need to do. So this is something that we will ask you to do on the midterm. If the pass string is null, you should return null. Okay, so that's easy enough. If you gave me a null string, I'm just gonna send null right back at you. So now I'm at the point where I can do some work here. So I'm going to declare the string that I'm gonna return and that starts out empty. So it's also nice to think about as we're going sort of, you know, special cases here. What if I get an empty string? What should I return? I should return an empty string. So if I get an empty string, I'm never gonna make any changes to this string, and it's just gonna be returned empty, which is correct. So let's try. So now I said I wanted to go through the string backwards. So again, this is one of those loops that, you know, you wanna get, get good at writing. This is one that I mess up frequently, actually, and I'm gonna show you guys some, um, some mistake code later, and we'll see there's one that has my favorite kind of mistake to make here. But I'm gonna start to reverse dot length minus one, because I'm going backwards. I'm gonna continue while i is greater than zero, and I'm going to decrement i at every stop. So, so there's nothing, there's no requirement in the CBTF or anywhere else that you guys solve these problems fully before you submit. You know, you can start off by saying, oh, it's mad at me. Okay, let's return to return. You can start off by trying things. Make sure that your null check is working. 
Okay, so if I call this with null, it works, good. Let's make sure that it reverses an empty string properly. Okay, that's good. Print it off nothing. I can put some, I put a little bit of extra help here in my print so that I can see what came back. In this case, I can see nothing came back, that's right. Let's put a print line in here to see what happens. If I do something that has one character, I get index zero, so that's good. Okay, let's use something that has a few more characters in it. Let's just make sure that my loop is working properly. Okay, so I start at four, the last valid index in this string, which has length five. And I go four, three, two, one, zero. Okay, so I'm going through backwards. Good. We will provide you with the string documentation on the midterm, along with the documentation for uh, one or two other classes that you might need. That said, if you're hunting around for some of these functions, you're probably, you know, gonna waste time that you need. So there's a couple of functions that we've asked you to use when working with strings, both on homework problems and on the midterm, that are probably worth just sort of remembering. One is to care array, to take a string, to convert it to an array of characters. Another one is care at, that allows me to extract a character from a particular position in the string. Another one is trim, take some white space from around the string. Split, take a string and split it into substrings based on some character. And these are, you know, you go through, you can go through the string documentation, you'll find lots and lots of different methods, and that's why it's, it can be tough sometimes you know, when you're in that sort of pressure cooker environment to find, okay, you know, what is that called again? So you might want to, you know, take these that you've seen before um, and we've asked you to use on some of the problems and make, make sure that you at least know about them, right? You know, oh, right, okay, it's trim, right? Maybe I don't remember how to call it, but I know that it exists. So here what I need is I need the care at function. So remember, I'm starting from the end of my string and I'm appending characters to the string I'm gonna return to the front. So I start at the back of the past string and I work those characters to the front of the string that I'm gonna return. I'm gonna call to reverse dot care at i. Okay. So I'm starting at the end, going to the beginning, adding characters to to reverse as I go. All right. Um, Let's tr let, let's tr for fun, let's try doing this the other way. So what about if I wanted to start at the end, start at the beginning and move to the end? So I can do this. I just have to be a little bit more careful here because I need to add the characters to the end of two return. <coughs> Happily, I can do that in Java. Nope, that's not what I wanted. I have to put them on the front. Sorry, here we go. Plus to return. There we go. So this time I'm going through in forward order, but rather than adding the characters to the end of to return, I'm adding them to the beginning. I'm saying to return equals the character plus the rest of to return. Right, so I can either go forward, add them to the beginning, go backward, add them to the end. There's also versions of this that convert the string into a character array, and then just use array indexing rather than care at. So there's a couple different ways to, to approach this problem. Questions on this before we go on? So, you know, again, this is the type of problem that uses, combines a couple of the tools that we've given you so far. Loops, working with strings, understanding that strings are represented as arrays of characters, et cetera, right? So we're combining a couple of things here. All right, let's do another one. Oh, let me, let me, let's look at a couple of, a couple of common mistakes here. Okay. So again, keep in mind, my objective here is not to pick on anybody. It's just to look at some, some attempts that are, that are close. This one's really close. So what does this do? 
This has like a lot of the pieces that we want, right? It checks the input for null, fantastic. It creates a new array that it's gonna use to store the output, also fantastic. At the end, on line 10, it returns a string that, you know, built from that character array, so that's all correct. It's got a loop. That loop goes backwards through the string, also correct. What's the problem? This does not work, yeah. Well, it's, it's definitely placing things in the wrong spot. What will this function return? If I feed it CS125, what am I gonna get out? Let's try it. It rebuilds the same string. The problem is on line eight. It says reverse array i is equal to input care at i. So I'm taking characters from one position in the input string and putting them in the same position in the reverse string. That's not going to work. Again, this is really close. It's almost there. All I need to do is I need to change either one of these. So I've gotta be moving like this. So I've got one index has to start at zero, the other has to start at input length minus one, and then they have to move like this. So I can either do, oh, where'd I go here? Here we go. Input dot length minus i, and I always have this extra minus one I have to stick in there, because i is gonna start at, well, is that right? I'm not sure, let's try it both ways. Oh, it's a string, right? Okay, I have an off by one error. There we go. I forget stuff like this sometimes. So what's happening now? So i starts at input dot length minus one. That's the last character, right? So I take input dot length minus one minus i. I can rewrite this to make it a little bit more clear. Minus one minus i. If input dot length is, if i is input dot length minus one, what's input dot length minus one minus i? Zero. So now my left side starts at zero, my right side starts at the end of the string, and as i increases, my left side's going to decrease. Sorry, that's wrong. Right, so as i decreases, there we go. So i's decreasing, the left side's going to increase, and the right side's going to decrease. So I've got this movement that I want, okay? Again, th this, this approach, this attempt was very close. You know, it had all the right building blocks, just didn't get, you know, that one last thing. Let's see, let's try another one here. You know what, I'm, I'm gonna move on. We can do more of these in a minute. Okay, so I wanna quickly rever uh, look at this string equality problem, because this is another one that I saw people really struggling with, um, and, I, and I wanna use this to sort of teach a different lesson about the world to you. Okay. So here was the problem. This appeared on a homework problem. Write a function called r equals that takes two strings. It's supposed to return equal if the two strings are equal, and then there's some conditions where I'm supposed to return true or false if one of them is null or the other is null or both are null. All right, so once we get through the, you know, assuming that my algorithm correctly handles the null conditions, which is the first thing to do, is eliminate the null cases, how am I gonna do this? What's my algorithm? So I could go through each string character by character, convert them both to character arrays, blah, blah, blah. Or I could just think, man, Java would be a terrible language if it didn't have a function to do this for me. Right, like, come on, really? It's like a 30-year-old programming language doesn't have a method to compare strings to each other, and of course it does. So there was really, you know, a lot of people overthought this problem, and that was fine. It gave you some practice at working with uh, character arrays and stuff like that. But as you go on as programmers, you're gonna start to develop some intuition about the things that should exist in the world. You know, when I pick up, start picking up a new language, frequently I'll be like, no, 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 no. This is too hard. This must already exist somewhere. Like, someone has solved this problem. I shouldn't have to do this myself. And normally, that's the case. 
So comparing two strings to each other, do I really need to write a new function to do that? No. I mean, sometimes Java feels like a low-level language, but it's not that low-level. And so, you know, if I look here and I look for equals, I find lots of hits. I find some things that look interesting up here, content equals, that's kind of interesting. And then I find a function called equals. Which takes an object, but if you play around with this, you can see that this will do the right thing. Compares the string to the specified object, and if I look at the more detailed, the result is true if and only if the argument is not null, and it's a string object that represents the same sequence of characters as this object. This is an instance method, so I have to have a valid string to do this. So part of the job of this function was to filter out some of the cases where I would have tried to call this on null. But let's look at sort of a common mistake here. Well, let's see, hold on. Where are my string equality ones? Yeah, here we go. All right, we can do this one in a minute. I'll, I'll just show you. Now, he, here, here's the over, here's the overthought solution. Right, top is, I think, correct. I'm not sure it gets the both null case correct, but we can fix that. And then I start here on line six. I'm, you know, creating new character arrays. I'm checking their length. That's a, that's a good thing. None of this is wrong. Um, and then I go character by character. Um, it's just unnecessary. So what was the specification of the problem? It said if the two strings are of either null, all right, so let's do this. So if either one is null, I'm gonna return false. Otherwise, I return first dot equals second. Yeah, that's the first word, sorry. Yeah, let's change these, because this is another problem with this, this attempt. Good. Yeah. This was all this was asking you to do. So, you know, don't overthink things. All right. Questions at this point? I have one more of these to do, and I think we have right about the right amount of time. All right, so string rotation. So we've given you a series of problems at this point in the semester, um, including the encrypt problem on MP1, including several small homework problems that are they're designed to try to force you to confront modular arithmetic. To, to be honest, this isn't necessarily something you're gonna use all the time, but when you do need it, it is incredibly helpful. So this problem appeared on the homework in one version as rotate right, and then it appeared on a quiz as rotate left. And people really struggled with this problem on the quiz, despite the fact that it's a small variation to the version of this that you did on the homework. So here's my approach to this. There is a very clever solution to this problem that some people got that uses substring. But I'm not gonna provide that solution. I'm gonna provide the solution that actually um, goes through character by character and moves things into place. Because I think that solution is more helpful for driving home sort of the pedagogical goal of this particular question. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna create a new character array, the same size as my input. So I know that this function doesn't modify the length of the string. So, but I also know that I need somewhere to put these values as I'm moving them from place to place. So I create a new character array to hold my output. Then I go through the string that's passed as a parameter character by character. And I can actually do this in any order. I can go forwards or backwards, it doesn't matter. Inside the loop, I'm gonna compute the new position for that character using modular arithmetic. And then I'm gonna copy the character into position in the new array. And then I can return that, you know, wrapped in a, a, a call to the string constructor, so I get a string back. All right, so let's try this. So what does this return? It returns a string. What's the name of the function? It's called rotate left. What does it take as an argument? It takes a string, call that input. 
and it also takes an int that tells me how far to rotate it. So I can put some things up at the top, like checking for null and stuff like that. Let's just skip that for the time being. So step one, going back to my create a new character array of the same size as the input. So I'm gonna call this return array, since that's what I'm gonna do with it. I'm gonna say new care input dot length. So again, sort of allocating arrays of different sizes and different types and different dimensionalities, something else that should be very familiar to you by now. Something that you can just, you know, put down without having to think about it too much or without having to look up a lot of examples. So now I'm writing a loop. That loop is going through my string. Okay, so I'm gonna go through every value in my string. I'm gonna use caret here. I could have also converted the input string into an array of characters as well, but this works fine. So the crux of these problems is always computing the position properly. And I've seen, you know, a lot of messy approaches to doing these things that, that to me really don't, you know, um, express an understanding of modular arithmetic. So remember, in most cases, when you're using the remainder operator or you're using, you know, what in other languages is a modulus operator, I only need to apply that once. If you're doing it more than once, you're probably doing something unnecessary. So I need to figure out what the new position is. Let's declare an int for that. I know that that new position depends on i. Now this problem asks me to rotate left. And so I'm gonna take i and I'm gonna subtract the rotation. So if, I didn't, if, if I'm at index two and I was rotating left by one, this character should end up at index one. What's the problem here? Well, the problem is if I give you a large rotation, it's very possible that this value ends up way into the negative numbers, right? Let's say I give you negative 100, and the string only has, you know, 10, 10 values. And this is gonna end up way, 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 way off the end of the array, and I'll immediately get an array index out of bounds exception if I try to use this. So what do I need to do? So here's where I use my modulus, or my remainder operator, unfortunately, in Java, to get things back under control. And I'm gonna do a modulus, or a remainder, with the length of the array. So whenever I'm trying to keep something within a certain bounds, that's always the right side of my modulus, right? So I wanna keep this value between zero and array dot length minus one, and so I apply this modulus. Now, I keep saying modulus in the hopes that maybe if I say it often enough, Java will fix this and actually have it be a modulus, but it's not. Remember, it's a remainder operator. There was a note in the question that pointed out this and also told you what to do about it. So a true modulus is never negative. If you were working with the language that provided a true modulus operator, you would be done here. You would have correctly computed the new position. In Java, this is a remainder operator, and so if I take a negative number and divide by another number, I get a negative remainder. And in this problem, it's very possible that this is gonna be negative because I'm shifting to the left. So if I give you a big left shift on a small array, likelihood is this is negative because it's bigger than input dot length. So all I need to do to fix this is if I have a negative remainder, to correct it to be the modulus, I simply add the length of the, the original modulus, right? So this is the little hack you have to do to get Java's remainder operator to do what you want. All right, so here, before we go any farther, let's just print I'm just gonna return blank string here. Uh, why is it mad about this? Oh, sorry. Bug on the slide. And I forgot my static here. 
Okay, good. Okay. Well, this is good. This is like these like dry runs they do before they hit the button on the spaceship, right? Like, does it rotate properly if the rotation is zero? If it doesn't, I'm in trouble. So it looks like it does. Now let's try something smaller. Okay, so left is original position, right is new position. So what should happen to the character at index zero? It should swap off to the left, to the right side of the array. It rotates off the left side, it ends up back on the right side. Okay, so that's good. Let me try a value that should yield me, again, so this is another case where I'm seeing identity. Why? Because I've rotated the string far enough that everything's back in its original position. But the real case here that I'm concerned about is if I use something that causes me to have to start wrapping around again. So I can try six, and I can see again, in the case of six, what's happened is I've rotated left five, I've recovered the original string, I've rotated left one more, and now I've moved things one character up. Okay, so at this point, I think I'm confident in this position value, and so I'm gonna use it. I'm gonna do input.care at i. Get rid of my println. Ah. Good. This is it. If I was doing the right rotation here, I could even, it would be even be simpler, because I wouldn't have to handle that case from five to seven. One of the things, you know, that, that is important when you're solving these problems is to read the instructions. So let me show you very quickly, I know we're almost done. Let me show you a, where did that one go? I'm not gonna pull this up, but there was a case where someone was actually checking, uh, had some logic to deal with the fact if rotation was negative but the specification for this problem said that it would never be negative. It's always positive. Okay. So, I'm done, right on time. Midterm zero starts tomorrow, good luck. I think you guys will do well. You guys know how to prepare, you know, get there, calm down, do your best, you know, fix your mistakes, work on generating some mistakes this week so you guys learn how to do that. MP2 is due today at 5 p.m. Um, if you're still working on it, that's good. It's good preparation for the midterm. We have office hours today. We do not have an MP out this week. That'll come out on Friday. We do have homework this week on objects. So again, good luck on the midterm. I will see you guys on Wednesday.